And now we come to the big one, the winner of our Irwin Prize for Secularist of the Year 2017. This year we're honouring another brave and determined woman from a Muslim background. Her name is Yasmin Raymond. Yasmin has been working as part of the One Law for All Sharia campaign, gathering together and bringing to public attention the testimonies of women who have been victimised by extremists in the Muslim communities in which they live. Inevitably, these activities have not been popular with some and have resulted in threats from Islamists to her own safety and to that of her family. One of her campaigns is to push for a wider public and political debate on marriage practices in Islam. She studied and written extensively on these practices and resulted the resulting harm that they do to women and children. She worked for some years with the um, Metropolitan Police in the area of forced marriage and so-called honour-based violence. Lately, she's been researching polygamy and temporary marriage and has a book on these topics coming out at the end of the year. Yasmin has spent much of the past two years trying to get the Cross-Government Hate Crimes Working Group to recognise the dangers faced by ex-Muslims and minorities, including Ahmadiyya Muslims, from Islamist extremists. Her commitment to advancing the rights of women is unquestionable and she's used her own home as a shelter for women who were under threat of murder and sexual violence. She recognises that a secular position in legal and policy areas is the only one that will protect women in these situations. I don't want to preempt Yasmin's speech because I know how annoying it is when you make all the points that the other person is about to make <laughs> and leave them with nothing to say. So. Please come up, Yasmin, and receive your award for Secularist of the Year 2017. Scott, I'm terrified. <laughs> oh, right, on with the glasses. Um, Terry made some jokes about the Oscars, and, um, and I was going to make a joke about the envelope. But um, when I told my son um, that I'd been nominated, he sent me a link to Gwyneth Paltrow's uh, Oscar um, speech from several years ago. And he said, whatever you do, Mum, don't do that. So I'm going to try my very best not, not, to, um, not to burst into tears. Um, I'm a bit overwhelmed. Oh, um, so please forgive me. I've not won a prize since the um, needlework prize at school, which is very long <laughs> ago. Um, so I've got a few thank yous, and I've got a couple of things that I want to go on to say. Um, a huge thank you to Terry, Stephen, Alistair, and everyone at the National Secular Society for this recognition. Um, but special thank you to Keith. Um, who has been an incredible source of support, advice, and a listening ear when I've needed it. There have been some dark days recently, and um, he's calmed me down over cups of tea, so I'm, I'm very grateful to him for that. Um, I'm incredibly humbled and honoured to be included in the list of nominees, especially as there are some personal heroines amongst them. Um, Asma Jangir, who um, it works in Pakistan, the country that my parents come from. And I, I watched it disintegrate over the course of my lifetime. Um, as I currently stand, I don't know if I will ever go back because of the danger that's posed to me because of my work here. And also because I don't want to put my family at further risk. Um, Ted Cantle, whose work I've followed, particularly since the... Um, the Alden Whites. I look forward to finding out more about Stephen Kith Kettle's work and, of course, Scott's and working together with you hopefully in the future. But to Hosan, my sister, my friend, um, and fellow campaigner in the One Law for All campaign, um, we should be standing up here together, I think. Um, there are a couple of other thank yous, and then I will go on to what I was going to say. Um, there were two women here without who, who support. I'm not sure I would have been able to keep going. To Mariam Namazi and Gita Segal, 
Um, I owe you so much. Um, we have we have fought some battles together, and I stood with Marion and the One Law for All campaign when um, when she had a very particular press amongst liberal Muslims. Um, forget about the extremists at once, um, and I think that's changed. And I was honoured to stand with her because she was brave enough to say the, the things. Um, that at that time I wasn't brave enough to say. And to Geetha, who I've learned so much from, and who I work with at the Centre for Secular Space, we keep on fighting and we keep on going. Um, and we do it because we've got each other's support. And finally to David, my husband, who doesn't often get a mention. Um, just um, That's the last thank you, but thank you for, for being my rock and um, you'll be helping with stuff when we get home. <laughs> <laughs> Some of what I was going to say has been said in terms of um, what I understand secularism to be. It's not anti-religion. Yasmin said it, Terry has said it. I think it's the only state structure that we can have that can limit the power of religion. I'm a woman of faith. It, it's not a conflict. It's not a conflict to, to have a religious belief and to also be a secularist. I want to limit and contain the power that religious bodies have. I'm a feminist and that doesn't sit comfortably with the faith that I was born into or that I've been raised in. And I'm not, and whilst religion does oppress women, um, I'm not saying that in secular spaces they're not, so we must always be vigilant whichever space we're in. And I also think, um, that when we talk about ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, that we have to remind ourselves of what goes before. Those subtle messages, those subtle messages every day that, that are taught in our schools, that are pumped into our homes through satellite TV channels, through drama, through film, um, that reinforce that othering of anyone who is not like us. So. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the work that, that I've done um, through the Centre of Secular Space, but, but also on my own. <coughs> a few years ago, um, I started looking at satellite TV channels, looking at a basic sky package, not one of the all singing, all dancing with movies and football. At that time, six years ago, there were 35 religious channels. And I'm only looking at the ones that, that are broadcast in the languages that I speak and that I understand. So English, Punjabi, Hindi and Urdu. Um, there are other, other channels in, in other languages, um, should you care to look out for them. But 35 channels where hate preachers like Zach and Neg are able to pump out their vile, where liberal, so-called liberal, um, Preachers like Ajmal Masru, who's based in East London, is also able to reinforce his, his role views on women and where women's place in society should be. And he's made this very, very clear to me himself personally by labelling me um, an apostate, um, which carries with it its own particular, particular issues. But these messages are there all the time. And I've tried to raise these issues and um, I've been shut down, whether I've done it through an organisation or through my own work, I've been shut down as Islamophobic um, and as a racist. Now this is deeply, deeply painful. I've been working on anti-racism issues and feminism for 32 years now. And there seems to be a movement that um, silences us by this use of Islamophobia. Islamophobia is the only form of racism that is now ever discussed. Now I'm not saying there is not anti-Muslim sentiment, there absolutely is, and Trump's had a mention, so I won't, I won't mention him again. Um, but to silence any dissent, any challenges with that allegation, and then to follow it up with the label of apostasy, and, um, is deeply dangerous in the community that I come from because it carries the death sentence. Mariam knows this only too well. And that's where the threats emanate from. And this is not about me personally. I'm supported. Um, I have a public position um, that I often take speaking at, at various venues. So, um, and I also have some inkling of, of how the police operate. 
so they're not particularly great um, a lot of the time. Um, <laughs> any dissent is silencing, yet Muslims are told that you don't speak up. Speaking up brings with it its own inherent dangers. And we're surrounded by this Islamist narrative, whether it's through those TV channels, whether it's through those drama series, where now the, the normalisation of the hijab, every image of a Muslim woman is now a hijab woman. There is no space for any Muslim woman who chooses to, un to not cover or who chooses not to adopt Islamist dress. The very way that religion is practised is so controlled. I don't recognise the Islam that is now um, put forward as, um, as the authentic Islam. And the state is complicit in, in propagating this message. Tony Blair and his sort of, you know, um, going around with a number of, of um, extremist preachers as these are the voices of the community without actually ever allowing the community to speak for themselves. The community is not one thing. So I think we have to be really careful and we have to learn the lessons of the past. If any of you have um, not read um, A Social History of the Third Reich by Richard Grimberger, I would, I would recommend that you do. It talks about how Goebbels used propaganda, about how music was, was taken over, that Wagner was, was pumped into factories, about the imagery that was used to promote um, the image of, of the Aryan race as supreme. And the Islamists are no exception, absolutely no exception, in terms of the, the modus operandi that they're choosing to follow. The other point I wanted to make was to pick up on something Yasmin had said earlier about secularism and the message. There is something very particular about how secular, secularism and secularists are viewed at the moment. It is impossible to get any sort of funding or recognition of secular work, particularly in feminist spaces. It's seen as, um, as anti-theist, as, um, as anti-religion, as racist, as discriminatory. Now I think that's part of the Islamist machinery, putting out that message and saying that they're not like us, so they, they don't want us to be able to practice, they're denying our right to have freedom of religion. Um, and I think they, they're gaining in power. They're gaining in power through the, the lobbies, through faith schools, through their connections to government, local and central, um, and, um, and now through, as we're seeing, through parallel legal systems and the Sharia courts. And we have to be really careful or there won't be many of us left. If you look at the black and minority ethnic women's sector, there are only faith-based organisations. Now there are 17 organisations left in London following the cuts. And most of those take a faith-based approach. Where are the groups, the new groups like South or Black Sisters? Where are the secular groups? Where do women who are seeking help and support who are suffering abuse that is justified by religion, that is often perpetrated by religious leaders, where do they go where they're not judged? There's a woman I'm working with, Gita and I are working with at the moment, who um, has suffered horrific abuse at the hands of um, an imam. She, she lives in, in London, um, and without giving away too much of her story, she's like many other Muslim women at this moment who have bought into the message of if you're ill you don't need to go and see a medical practitioner, you need to go and see a shaykh um, who will give you a talisman, he will give you prayers, he will give you absolution and, and all your problems will be solved. Um, and this, this man has basically exploited her vulnerability, taken wads of money from her um, and um, and basically been procuring her for, um, and sexually exploiting her to, um, to powerful men in the community. She's just one story. There's something going on in this capital that is being ignored. Take a walk down Commercial Road, just walk around the East End, walk around Tower Hamlets, you will see Yajama clinics all over. Resolution is now absolutely religious for some women. There is no other choice. 
So to the untrained eye, these are cupping clinics where you can go for an alternative therapy. But actually, we've got families in this country through those media channels I talked about at the beginning, through community networks being told that you don't need to sit. If you've got mental health problems, it's, it, it's basically that you're not religious enough and that you need to get a talisman and you need to pray and you need to beg for forgiveness. If you've got a physical ailment, it's a punishment from God because you are not religious enough. If you have a child born with a disability, it is because you are not religious enough and you must beg for forgiveness. And these are popping up all over the East End, yet where is the conversation about them? And it's really difficult. Sometimes there are a, a lone voice is trying to raise um, some of these issues. Terry mentioned um, my work on marriage practices, um, polygamy and temporary marriages. It's almost impossible to get the government to take on this issue. I thought naively for a few years that it was because it was in the too difficult box. And now I think it's because it's a religious practice. Forced marriage and honour-based violence could so easily be dismissed because they were seen to be cultural practices. You had religious leader after religious leader saying this has nothing to do with Islam, nothing to do with Sikhism, nothing to do with Hinduism. There is no denying that polygamy and temporary marriage are Islamic marriage practices. It goes to the very core of how the state can balance freedom of religion with freedom from harm and abuse. It's raised occasionally. Baroness um, Barsi raised it in terms of um, immigration. Baroness Flavor raised it in terms of welfare benefits. Nobody ever talks about the women and the children and what it does to those women and children. We have no idea of the numbers of um, families who were in these, these multiple marriage setups. And yet the state will be picking up the pieces at some point of children in the care system of mothers who, um, who will need support to deal with the mental health impacts and the fallout. And in the meantime, because we're afraid of challenging these um, extremist interpretations of Islam, the men will continue to get away with it. And if we allow them to get away with this, isn't this just the slippery road to child marriage at some point? Child marriage is also endorsed by Islam. As a Muslim, I want somebody to stand up and start with me to, start to say that there is no space anywhere, not just in the UK, but anywhere for these practices. Um, there are other things that, I, that I, I had wanted to talk about, but I, I think I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to stop there because um, I'm, I'm getting quite emotional. <laughs> I just want to, to end um, on, on something that was said earlier about the lived experiences that I think Kazan said it about the, the lived experiences of people. Everything, everything from our lives is being eroded. I hate identity politics. I'm not just a Muslim woman. I'm a woman. I'm a human being. I'm many things. I grew up in the North East. It makes me a Geordie, not a Londoner. Um, there are so many facets to my personality and who I am, just as there would be with you. Think about what it means to be reduced to just one aspect of who you are and what that does. And then to have someone come and tell you, and groups of very powerful people, tell you what that something should be. This is how you should dress. This is what you can eat. This is what you can wear. Um, you can't listen to music. You can't practice your faith in the way that you have. I'm, the Sufi shrines is, uh, have been such an important part of my life, and we've recently seen um, the bombing at um, the shrine of Shahbaz Galanda in Pakistan. The exclusion of women from every public place, and yet when the government does reports about the, the education attainment of, of Pakistani Bangladeshi women, particularly Muslim women, as we're, as we're now labelled, and says they're not part of the, um, of, the um, of the workforce, they never ask the question as to why. Yes, there's discrimination, but there's also great powers within the community who are holding women back, and in turn holding a lot of the men back too, by creating this victim narrative and letting that victim narrative um, take hold as strongly as it has. We've got to challenge identity politics, wherever it is, 
and we have to stand together, people of faith, people of no faith, to do that, because the cost is too frightening. If I can sit in London and face um, and Maria and Giba and Hosanna and face some of the threats that we face, threats of sexual violence, threats of death, threats of them, I mean the sexual violence is not just, just directed at us. The most frightening thing was the threat that was made against my daughter and my mother. This is not Pakistan, this is not Bangladesh, this is not Iraq, this is not Kurdistan, this is not Iran, this is the United Kingdom, this is London 2017. And the very same groups that make those threats are the groups who have access to the corridors of power. We have to be really careful and we have to be really, really vigilant. Um, I'm sorry to bring the room down. <laughs> sorry, yes, and I followed you on that. Um, but thank you again um, for this award. The fight continues and hopefully we'll fight it together. Thank you very much.